currently I characterize like 3D uh, generative AI into three categories. The first one is text to texture. And I think that part is the closest to production part because mm -hmm. texturing is just easier compared to uh, high quality modeling. But generating high quality texture is not easy because uh, you want the te your texture to, to be sharp, to have styles, you have high resolution, you have PBR. There are many, many things to do. And uh, we're we're proud that uh, we have uh, pushed this direction the furthest uh, in the market. I would say text texture is already uh, somewhat with like uh, one, of, one of its feet in those uh, production, production bar. How long do you think it's going to take before we are going to get mid-journey level 3D models generated by AI? A lot of people ask me about that. So I will actually split uh, the discussion into two parts. The first one is the market part. The second part is the technology part. Welcome to a new episode of XR and AI Spotlight, the show where we give the stage to creative technologists, founders, and entrepreneurs who are pushing the boundaries at the intersection between XR and AI. My name is Gabriele Romagnoli. I'm your host, and I'm honored to be here today with Ethan Hu. Ethan holds a PhD in computer graphic and AI at MIT. He's a serial, found, he's a serial founder in Silicon Valley and CEO at Meshi, an AI-powered tool that allows you to create 3D models solely from text or even texture them in under a minute. Meshi ranked second among nearly 100 product launched on Product Hunt and has recently announced an integration with Snap AR Lens Studio. Join this episode to learn about the three parameters that make a great 3D generative AI tool, the importance of control during the creative process, the cases in which 3D generated models can already be used for productions and the two main obstacles to get to mid-journey level 3D Gen AI models. But before we get into it, I wanted to thank the sponsor for today, Cognitive 3D, who made this episode possible. Cognitive 3D is an analytic platform to improve how organizations can analyze user behavior in VR and AR and turn the findings into actionable insight. Cognitive 3D has an handy SDK that integrates easily in Unity and Unreal. Data are collected and displayed in 3D contextually to help you improve user engagement and retention. Whether you are designing, training or simulation, running consumer research or creating games and entertainment content, Cognitive 3D will change the way you track and learn from your data. Head to Cognitive3D.com to learn more. And now, let's roll the title and welcome Ethan on stage. What makes a 3D Gen AI model, a 3D Gen AI product, good? Yeah, um, I think that's a very insightful question because I think nowadays there are many products out there and uh, uh, some are like better made than others. So in my humble opinion, I think the first one is definitely quality because um, people can wait, people can just uh, uh, like uh, type more text prompt as long as they get high quality model and uh, they want the model to have good textures nice poly count. I mean, they don't want something, uh, a model, a mesh with like 1 million triangles just representing an apple or something like that. Uh, they want good UV, uh, UV uh, unwrapping and good topology. Uh, that's for the mesh part. And also for the texture part, people want like 4K texture, uh, sometimes with PBR, because nowadays, you know, almost every mobile game come with PBR. And uh, uh, that's for the quality part. I think that's a, uh, 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 first priority um, for a good generative AI product for 3D. Um, and I think there are other things that are pretty important as well, uh, especially diversity. I mean, uh, it's easy for you to create a generative AI system that can only generate chairs of different styles, um, but that's going, not going to be uh, super helpful because people definitely want something like Einstein riding a uh, a horse or Mars or something like that, those crazy things, uh, instead of just chairs or tables uh, or a vase. Uh, actually, you can 
uh, already use procedural generation for a single category of ob objects. But for a good competitive 3D generative AI system, you want it to have good diversity in the um, object it can generate. Um, and also speeding is important. Um, it's often good. We talk to a lot of users, and uh, uh, the answer is um, it's possible for them to, to wait for, let's say, um, 30 minutes to get a really high quality model. But it's also important to um, just provide a few pre uh, preview model within one minute or two. Um, so I think basically um, quality comes first, and then diversity, and then um, speed. So quality, diversity, and speed. That's I, I think if you can achieve those two, three simultaneously, then you are definitely building a good generative AI product for 3D. So, and you mentioned a couple of things, and I, one thing that I've seen many of several tools have been struggling is this UV. Yeah, yeah, that's very how, true. <laughs> how are you tackling that? Because you can see the textures, oh. the textures are improving, but making yep. changes to that, it, it is hell. How are you tackling that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. So to be honest, we're st we're still using like uh, UV automatic UV unwrapping system. Uh, if your model doesn't come with UV, and then we'll automatically UV unwrap it using pre-generative AI technology. That means um, like there are a lot of tools that can automatically unwrap your UV, basically built in every digital content creation system. Um, currently, we are uh, still thinking about it, it. Maybe there's a way. Uh, because AI has understanding of different parts of the object. And uh, if you um, unwrap your model into like different UV islands, it's better to make your cut uh, in the place where the material changes or, uh, or the component switches. Um, so currently, we're, we're still looking into that. But uh, uh, to be honest, we, we haven't, uh, there's no um, major breakthrough uh, in both the academia and uh, in the product building side um, regarding better UV unwrapping, unfortunately. But uh, we hear a lot of uh, input from the user. People really want uh, automatic UV unwrapping and uh, good retopology uh, features uh, based on generative AI, but that's still being developed. Yeah, and so UV unwrapping is so much related to the texture of the model. And I think one of the things that makes specifically um, um, Meshi unique is their text to texture. Can you maybe yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're really proud of our text to texture system. And uh, um, people have come up with very creative ways to, to use that. Um, for example, um, people use that for uh, 3D printing. Let's say you have a, especially when you're doing 3D printing with colors. Uh, let's say you have a mm -hmm. single model with a uh, single character model or uh, some kind of uh, um, whatever uh, you can 3D print. Um, usually a 3D printing model don't have re really nice texture. Like they are just a beer model sometimes. Sometimes they have pure colors. Um, but when it comes to combined with um, high quality color for 3D printing, you can really do a lot of exciting things, um, especially if you just provide a model to Meshi and you type in uh, for a single model, beer model with UV unwrapped, uh, you can generate like textures of uh, many different styles. Let's say a character, you can make it carton, you can make it comic. And I've seen that the styles is something that you recently announced, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, styles are important because uh, uh, even if, let's say, you have 10 extremely high quality models, but they are not style consistent, then uh, they will just not look very good if you put them together. So styles are important. Um, and uh, we also support 4K resolution. Uh, that indeed creates a lot of uh, clarity and detail in the AI texturing system. And uh, um, I think currently uh, we are also um, we're trying to like speed up the process. Now it takes like one minute per, per texturing. And uh, uh, we are also trying to, uh, sometimes uh, if you use AI texturing to texture a object, um, it works best if you decompose that object into different parts. Let's say you're um, texturing a using meshy to- Or a wall, maybe. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's just a easier. It's just e easier for AI to uh, texture a single component compared to just feeding everything into a, a uh, monolithic mesh and feed that into AI. And uh, uh, that would be just a uh, trickier. And there are people in our community uh, very creatively come up with this solution. If you're um, texturing a arm model, you can uh, just uh, split that into different components. And uh, the shoulder part, the chest part, the leg part can be uh, textured separately. And then you blend those uh, maps in using in Photoshop. And then you get extremely high quality uh, textures that are almost the same quality as what you can see in a, a serious production uh, workflow. Cool stuff, cool stuff. I mean, we are going to discuss about production workflow because that is one of the big <laughs> elephants in the room regarding this, this model. Yeah. Before that, I want to get off the chest a question. So we discussed a little about um, text to textured models. We discussed a bit about text to 3D. Uh, one of the modality which you also support is image to 3D, right? So you feed yep. an image. Uh, it could be a character. It could be an object. And then you... Um, basically provide after one minute or two uh, this 3D model. But how do you come up with the texture on the back of the model when you provide <laughs> the just input? Yeah, that's a uh, great question. So that's actually the most difficult part, which is uh, use AI to imagine uh, what the object looks like uh, in different camera views because you're just providing the front view and uh, uh, we need to use AI to imagine like the side views, the back view, the top-down view, uh, all kinds of those views. Uh, so basically, uh, it works like this. So um, because like AI has seen many um, images, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we we just uh, want, uh, but current the limitation of uh, like stable diffusion and mid journey is that it it has only two D understanding of everything in the world. So uh, it is actually possible uh, if you combine the 3D knowledge and 2D knowledge, and it's possible for us to come up with an AI that can uh, basically rotate the camera given the front view image. So let's say you, ha you have a, uh, you only, now you only have a front view image of, of, of your mesh. And uh, by training our AI in, a, in this kind of 2D plus 3D way, you can rotate your camera by 45 degrees. And uh, some parts of the object are still uh, from the front view because there is a uh, slight overview between like uh, a 45 degree rotated camera uh, camera position compared to the front view position. And then the AI can just uh, imagine the unseen part. So that's based on the knowledge it gets from 3D um, data. So uh, it's actually so hard it's sort of because- Stepwise uh, <laughs> step camera movement and reimagination while the camera moves in, in, let's say, steps around the model. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a simple, simplified way. Because uh, let's imagine this. If you have an AI that can uh, have a perfect uh, imagination of um, <clears throat> what the camera, uh, what the object will look like at different camera views. You can just use photogrammetry to do the 3D reconstruction, right? It's just 3D scanning. Yeah, right. but uh, in practice, you run into two problems. <clears throat> the first one is view consistency, because um, uh, let's say uh, you have a front view and then you uh, you have two cameras. One is on the on the left looking at the object. The other one is on the right looking at the object. How do you ensure? Uh, the imagination of the two cameras are consistent. That's the view consistency issue. If you don't have that, then um, basically you tend to get very random results. That's challenging one. And challenge two is uh, you have to do the imagination part. And that's based on a lot of data AI have seen. Uh, so uh, it's basically doing some kind of uh, imagination. But uh, uh, miraculously, uh, it sometimes works pretty well. and. Uh, Sometimes it doesn't, then you get a blurry back. But, uh, but in most cases, you still get some kind of clarity. And the fact is that sometimes I see almost the imagination part adding value to the model. It's not just completing it. It's not just filling it up. It is adding... I remember time ago, I was building, for example, like a, a totem, like an Incan totem, and I fit it the front view. Mm -hmm. And then I was I got something back that was like, oh, the, 
the back is almost better than the front. Uh, <laughs> in, in a way, you kind of like generate and reimagine. So sometimes it's not just about the, the generation helps you to fill up the, the back and, okay, you're done with it. No, it adds extra value to it. Sometimes. And sometimes you get something very weird. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very true. Um, and uh, I think that depends on what's your goal of using AI. Sometimes people use AI to unleash their creativity. They want to get something, uh, just materialize your materialize your uh, imagination. So in this case, uh, it's always good for AI to come up with something that is uh, uh, weirdly Good looking. Uh, uh, that's use case one. The, the other use case is you want your AI to follow your input. That uh, comes to the controllability stuff. And uh, uh, you really want AI to follow your instruction. You don't want it to create something weird. Um, but uh, in, in any case, I think things are improving. Uh, we, we are trying to give our AI more imagination power and uh, more controllability. I mean, create something people want or material materialize something that people have in their imagination. Those two are exciting use cases of generative AI for 3D. You mentioned a very critical word, control. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and how do you see, so just for people that are listening, right? We, we are discussing about, uh, in, a tool, in the case of a tool like Meshi, you can just write text and it's, you're gonna, you could get a texture 3D model. You could get an image mm -hmm. and then you could get a texture 3D model. You could get text plus a 3D model without texture and get a texture 3D model. So these are all different mm -hmm. ways in which the, the user is progressively increasing or differentiating the control that he has on his input and what he gets out. How are you enabling user to have more control within these modes? And maybe do you see other ways in which the user can get extra control on that process? Yeah, that's a really good question because um, people always complain that AI is not creating uh, what they want and uh, having better control is always something, uh, it's just like you have a, um, you always want your AI to follow your instructions, uh, but uh, it's not always the case. So uh, back to your question, which is, is there any way we can allow more control to the system? So one thing we're imagine, uh, still in our imagination, we haven't built it yet, is that we can have something like a ChatGPT style uh, 3D uh, text mm. modeler, where you can, if you create a model using text to 3D, and then you can say, uh, just want bigger eyes, and we just want to uh, change its cloth from maybe uh, blue to red, something like that. Maybe it's, it's that's something we can do to offer more mm -hmm. control. Um, but that's, uh, I would say that's still uh, just in imagination. And uh, currently people's effort are mainly focused on how do we improve the control uh, when we only have a single round of interaction. Let's say uh, you, you can have a text prompt describing like I want, uh, like this character have uh, big ears or a furious face, uh, but sometimes it's not just creating what you want. Uh, so this this is very related to like uh, how uh, the text, the, the ability for text to control the uh, output. It's just like Dolly 3 has this amazing power, amazing power of uh, uh, text control, but uh, for uh, earlier versions of Dolly or other, uh, or maybe stable diffusion 1.5, uh, the controllability isn't go going to be uh, very good. So uh, it's a, you can always improve control by providing better, uh, like maybe something like a text encoder or providing uh, more data to, to your data set. Um, I think having uh, control is always what people want, but uh, um, sometimes like, uh, images 3D just offers better control compared to Texas 3D because uh, it's hard to describe the entire front view of your character just use but, text. You know, <laughs> there was one thing that you brought up that it, I found very interesting and it, it was always lingering in my head, but I didn't articulate it like you did. Like there is one way of having control that is first time right. I write something, yeah. I put something and I get what I want. And then there is a second level of providing control that is the second iteration. Right. That is like, oh, I now got this on this maybe preview. 
I want to change this part. And then that's the moment that you can, for example, like in paint, right? Or yeah. when you can <laughs> replace. So these are very interesting way. And would you, how much do you need a first time right if you are able to iterate on what you have done? Well, uh, that's a, a very interesting question. And uh, currently, we uh, so for generative AI in 3D, uh, we haven't developed so many features compared to those 2D generative AI systems. Yeah. Like yeah. we don't have 3D in painting yet. Uh, and, and someone, uh, some some user just told me that he really wants a 3D control net where uh, just like 2D control net, you can uh, have a skeleton as input and then you can have the character generated uh, following that post. I think that's a very exciting idea and uh, uh, probably worth investigating. Um, and regarding your question, I think at this point, people are still trying to um, improve the uh, control of the first stage, the very initial stage. No, and after we right. get the maximum of it, we can do the iteration thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, it's just that because when we are talking about this, things are moving at a speed uh, that is unprecedented. Um, mm -hmm. And the number of papers that is coming out, the number, the amount of research, and also how yeah. relatively easy it is to implement something like that in a model, in a new tool, it, it is it is something that makes you dream and make you imagine, let's say, uh, and and think about what if there is indeed like a three D in painting. Um, but I think it's also good to go back to the ground, right, and look at what we have now because I think it's a, it is very powerful already. And is when so when are the case where 3D so when are the case when model 3D model generated with AI can already be used for production? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And uh, we are working very hard towards that goal. So currently I characterize like 3D uh, generative AI into three categories. The first one is text detection. And I think that part is the closest to production part because uh, mm -hmm. texturing is just easier uh, compared to uh, high quality modeling because um, texture, I would say is like a 2.5D problem. Uh, it's like your, it's 3D, but uh, the generated result is still in, in 2D. So I would say 2.5D. Uh, but generating uh, high quality texture uh, is not easy because uh, you want the your texture to, to be sharp, to have styles, to have high resolution, to have PBR. There are many, many things to do. And uh, we're, we're proud that uh, we have uh, pushed this direction the furthest uh, in the market. And we have already seen people uh, using like texture texture for um, environment assets and like um, in, in CG artwork, especially for assets that are, that are far away um, because uh, you know, like you wouldn't use AI for the hero asset, like the main character in your game, but for like a tree far away, uh, a house far away, uh, you can uh, actually uh, something that is uh, medium to uh, too far, uh, the nearest thing you wouldn't create with AI, but the medium distance and uh, things are far away uh, using AI is perfectly fine. Uh, so I would say text texture is already uh, somewhat with like uh, one, of, one of its feet in those uh, production production bar. Uh, for tech to 3D, um, still you will start with environment assets because for, um, for characters, you ha you actually have uh, so uh, in the game industry, people uh, create three D assets in uh, many ways. But for those core assets, it it always happens where uh, you can have a you first do, draw a two D concept art, like with front view, side view, and back view, and then uh, the modeler's job is to create a three D model out of the two D images. But there are some cases where, uh, let's say, you're creating environment uh, assets like. Uh, maybe just a stone or a flower in your scene, uh, you directly go from the text description without the 2D painting to 3D. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, in those cases, you can use Tactics 3D to generate um, those uh, uh, 3D assets. Um, but I was I would say um, you still need to, uh, uh, it, it will take a while before we can really use um, Tactics 3D for important assets. Uh, it's easy for you to generate an apple or uh, like uh, 
a car or something like like that uh, using Texas 3D in your game. Uh, but uh, for things that are more important, uh, still we haven't reached that bar. Uh, especially if you come, uh, if you are working with something that want, you want to animate, because uh, if you want to animate animate a mesh, then you have to have nice quad phases. Currently, uh, what AI can generate is all triangles, and that will create problems if you want to uh, uh, make a skeleton out of it and do the animation. Um, and for static objects that are far away, Texas 3D are already useful uh, in many cases, I, I would say. And uh, for images 3D, uh, they are good for uh, NPCs, uh, it, it particularly uh, unimportant ones. I mean, I'm pretty humble with AI, what AI can generate right now, uh, but uh, things are moving very quickly. So no, um... no, absolutely. <laughs> but I, I think I think honestly, uh, either I really appreciate it, and I think everybody here listening should ap ap appreciate like clarity and and we should still remember that someone without 3D skills could type something and could get a 3D model that he could put in a far distance of his game. I mean, like, this is insane. Yeah. I still think it's insane. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for, like, when you're talking about production, I would assume it's a pretty professional use cases. Uh, no, no, there are, like, uh, UGC cases where, uh, like, people, especially for, like, indie game developers, um, people who, like, uh, I'm a coder. Uh, I, I try to learn how to uh, use Blender. Uh, it's really hard for me. <laughs> so uh, if I have uh, this kind of uh, capability to generate something just to use uh, uh, text, that would be very, very nice, uh, especially for those cases where you don't have a, uh, you don't have that extremely high standard, like AAA level standard on, on your asset, right. <laughs> then Texas yeah. 3D is already uh, useful. I just wanted to have a quick break to remind you that the recording of these episodes and many more great conversations with incredible experts are available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Just head over to my profile or the episode description, open up the link in bio, and pick your platform of choice. And now, let's get back to the show. So how often or have you seen at all people... Uh, improving a 3D model that was generated in some ways, uh, the topology or maybe the textures. Is that something that happens? How And if so, how often? Uh, you mean like how often do people have to further polish the results generated by AI? Yes. So are people approaching these 3D Gen AIs that I get something rough and then I work on it and then I improve it and then it's okay? Because the way you first described production was like you get something asset that is ready because you could do you could put a tree in a far distance or a house in a far distance and probably yeah. you would need to even to touch that model. But in the case that you you are very happy with what you have got. Uh, it, does it happen often, if at all, about people working on that model and improving it, texture, topology, or so on? Does that happen? Um, so to be honest, currently AI generated 3D models are not that friendly to uh, further adjustment. So there are many reasons. The first one is, as you mentioned, the UV unwrapping and topology isn't going to be good. And you get a bunch of uh, random triangle phases. Uh, uh, you can always remesh it, uh, like maybe use quad remesher or Lee remesher and then do further adjustment. Uh, that's one possibility. Um, but the thing is, uh, if you consider the work, work, uh, the use case of uh, generative AI for 3D, then it's often the case that the user don't really have um, this kind of uh, uh, advanced 3D modeling skills. And that's why they're uh, coming to a AI tool, right? Yeah, right. So, uh, for those cases, um, asking our users to make further adjustment uh, is it just, uh, I believe, asking too much uh, for our mm -hmm. users. So we always aim to just get uh, uh, ask the, uh, the AI to have everything down so you don't have to make further adjustment. But you are right. Uh, if we make the results more adjustable, uh, likely like with better UV, better topology, then it will create more value uh, even to professional users. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and I think this is, again, a technology and the users are also going to evolve with this technology and the way they create. So this is like for who we are making the tool. Is that for a high end professional? No, probably it's not. If for the people that want to use it, want to start creating 3D and they're going to grow also their production workflow with us, with, with the tool. Yeah, I firmly believe in that because like lowering the barrier for people who want 3D models, but they um, they haven't just spent a lot of time learning like how to use Max, Blender, Maya to do the modeling. Uh, that's our mission to lower the barrier so that everyone can create a 3D model. Absolutely. And on that mission, right, spreading is uh, it's important, right? And it's not just about spreading about your own tool, your own platform, but also providing an API that can support others, right? Are there some API integration stories or something uh, that you think it's worth sharing? Yeah, uh, uh, we had a lot of fun doing that, actually. Um, because as a generative AI tool uh, uh, for 3D, you know, the current issue for 3D is that uh, 3D asset itself is a niche market. Uh, compared to like 2D images, let's say if you send me a 3D model on WhatsApp or uh, on LinkedIn, then uh, there's no preview on it in any kind of uh, uh, IM software. Uh, and 90% uh, of the people, I guess maybe 99% of the people don't know how to actually open the FBX file. Uh, so that what does that mean? That means you are need a uh, environment for people to consume your 3D assets. So uh, we have tried that uh, in, uh, I think there are two noteworthy cases. The first one is our collaboration with a uh, MMORPG game, Soul Chronicle. So in the past, if you, uh, like uh, the, the the fashion bows, the cloth you wear in the virtual world is generated by 3D artists. But uh, with generative AI, with our texture texture functionality, you can just type in, let's say, uh, I want a uh, metallic armor, or I want something like uh, a Japanese Rusty anime style, or... <laughs> yeah, something like that. Uh, you can just type in that, and so that every user can have a very different, very unique. Uh, the, uh, like uh, they have very very unique look, and that's that will just add more fun to your game. Uh, th that's one thing uh, using our Meshi API, and uh, we also uh, integrated our API. Uh, uh, I mean, have our API integrated into uh, Snapchat's Lens Studio creation tool, so that uh, a lot of people who are doing like AR creation can leverage our generative AI features to. Uh, like reduce the time they find 3D assets or create one. So uh, I think it's important for us, as you mentioned, uh, spreading is important. Uh, it's we're super super friendly to um, have our API integrated into different ecosystems so that we can focus on our part, which is uh, just improve the quality and improve the speed, improve the diversity. Going back to those three points, right? So what makes a good 3D model is the quality, <laughs> the speed of generation, and the variety, right? The diversity. Exactly. Exactly. Great. So <laughs> now, but technically, so you are in this and you have a scientific background. You know where the industry is going. How long do you think it's going to take before we are going to get mid-journey level 3D models generated by AI? Wow, that's a awesome question, and uh, uh, a lot of people ask me about that. So I will actually split uh, the discussion into uh, two parts. The first one is the market part. The second part is the technology part. So uh, in order for something to be commercially successful or create value to your user, uh, I think you, you need both of the, the two parts to be uh, valid. The first one is there has to be a real market real user need for uh, what we are creating. The second thing is there has to be the required technology that is mature, creating quality that is good enough to solve our user problem. So uh, let's talk about the marketing, uh, the market size problem uh, first. So currently the issue about uh, generative AI for 3D uh, for consumer cases is that uh, uh, there's no large consumer case, uh, consumer use cases. Mm -hmm. uh, as we mentioned, like uh, uh, like people who consume 3D models uh, is a very small uh, group of people. Like uh, I, I know you're working in the XR industry, uh, 
like there, I have friends in the game industry, in the film industry. They work with FBX, uh, OBJ, uh, USDZ files all the day. Uh, but the problem is, um, uh, like, if you ask someone who uh, use images uh, with ninety nine percent of probability, uh, he just don't work with three D. Uh, I think there's there's one. Uh, driving force that can make everything change, which is the uh, mass adoption and popularity of uh, VR and XR headsets. So uh, I would say currently we have, uh, according to my data, you can, uh, maybe you have more accurate data. So uh, what I learned is we have like 8 million MAUs of uh, uh, XR headsets. Uh, if we have, if one day the number goes up to like 50 million or 100 million, then, uh, I'm sure that people wouldn't be satisfied with just images or videos. They would definitely need something that is 3D and inter interactive. And imagine that one day there's a one, 100 million people leading 3D models, and that would just create a huge consumer level use case for those 3D models. And that will make generative AI, uh, something like 3D mid journey more mature. Um, uh, I mean, mature market-wise because uh, it's, uh, a product won't be successful if it's it, uh, it uh, output is good, but uh, nobody needs it, right? So you 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 you're go, going to need someone needs it. So I think that would be the year, maybe twenty twenty seven or twenty twenty eight. Not you know, sure about your opinion, but it takes time. I th I think uh, so. There is one extra. I mean, let's say alternative that I see beyond what you said before. After you move down to the technology, that is certainly another important point, and that is, I think that. Uh, 3D can also be a way to generate 2D in the sense that there are now these ways with stable diffusion where you can, for example, pose a 3D model or assemble a mm -hmm. scene. And to some extent, um, if you manage to nail the, the right level of complexity of, the, of that 3D tool, you can use that 3D to assemble a scene, the composition, change the camera, and get something out of it that is so much better because you had more control. Then we go back to that topic that we were discussing. So yeah. maybe AI and a 3D AI enabled tool, tool set that could be for, hey, I got a model. Now I can get it mm -hmm. to rig it and skin it, pose it the way I want it. I put some blocks in the background and maybe those are 3D generated houses. But then with for example, stable diffusion or a model like that, then I could say, okay, now I'm getting something that is incredible, something that is really mine in which I participated more actively in the creation process. That is one way in which I see 3D becoming also more adopted potentially, but I'm not sure what, what you think of it. Um, yeah, we have a, I have a lot of friends asking if it's possible to, um, like you just provide an image, like let's say you have a, um, uh, like countryside house with, with a, uh, in front of a forest, is, is it possible for us to just take uh, that image as input to AI and then uh, it generate a structured thing with everything being uh, reconstructed as a 3D model so that you can move your camera, you can fly through, uh, you can do whatever, uh, re, uh, recompositing uh, everything. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a, that would be a very uh, interesting use case um, but I would say maybe regarding, like considering how uh, those generative AI systems for video are today. So maybe um, it's easier to keep everything in three uh, in 2D without a explicitly constructed um, mm -hmm. 3D, uh, 3D model or a scene tree or something like that. Uh, and uh, if your end goal is to just get a different view, a different camera view of, uh, of your thing, then I would say uh, the generative AI 2D or video technologies are better fit for your problem. Mm -hmm. And Me. I firmly believe that people need 3D because people need interactivity. And that's something that's mm -hmm. really important. Uh, you want your uh, cars to move, you want your characters to dance, uh, you want your um, like monsters to fly in the air. Uh, and uh, uh, that's why you need 3D. Uh, if you don't have that, why don't you just generate a 2D video or uh, 2D images, right? Uh, so uh that so that's why that's what makes me think that uh, ar and vr mm -hmm. uh that's 
because you need interactivity in AR and VR, and interactive interactivity means you need three assets that you can observe in different angles. Uh, you can uh, put it in whatever part, right? <laughs> and that's why, and that's why the, the the partnership with Snap just makes so much sense at this point. <laughs> when we think yeah, about yeah, it, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I mean, so, without AR, then 3D doesn't make make much sense, right? I understand. I understand. Um, so maybe to kind of like start closing this one question. Oh, wait, you mentioned about we we were almost forgetting to tackle the technological part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can, so, can you? Yeah, <laughs> I'll briefly cover that. Uh, so I think we, at this point, we have only solved 10% of the technology issue. Uh, we, we still lack uh, like properly UV unwrapped models. We don't have good topology. And uh, sometimes the controllability is not good. The poly count is extremely high that uh, will blow your app up. Um, and the textures, uh, sometimes the PBR can go into issues. Uh, but I'm uh, pretty optimistic about the remaining 90% part because uh, I have been working in uh, computer graphic research for uh, a decade. So uh, and the, the recent advancement in generative AI for 3D is just incredible. Like. Uh, I have never seen uh, people in the academia so crazy about the single problem, uh, which is use text or image images to generate 3D asset. So I firmly believe um, we will have a, a accelerated development uh, for the next two or three years for the technology to mature. So if you combine the market side and the technology side, um, I think maybe in the year uh, 20, 26 or 2027, we'll have something that is um, that can stand uh, as a something like a 3D mid journey. Before that, you can have a 3D mid journey for niche use cases, for example, for 3D printing, that's good. But uh, you will not have something like mid journey with uh, something, uh, I believe, 17 million users, because you don't have 17 million users who require a 3D asset. Yeah. Ada, I think that uh, amen to that. So I think we should plan another conversation in 2026 uh, and see if your <laughs> prediction. <laughs> like the, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it comes earlier. <laughs> no, absolutely, absolutely. And I hope uh, to have another chat with you and maybe reconnect uh, to see how Mesh is doing in between. Because I think, as you said, there is a lot of uh, uh, excitement and technological advancement. And I think users are also starting to understand when to use it, how to use it, when to take advantage of it, and um, and yeah, that is certainly that is certainly going to move faster than we think. Uh, besides, we already think it's going to be fast. Yeah, um, I mean, I have been working in this field, focusing on this field for one year, and uh, it's kind of incredible that uh, what we are generating today is just uh, out of our our own imagination six months ago, um, and uh, it takes hard work but it pays off. Uh, sometimes you just get some surprise and uh, uh, and our users are creative. They, they, they can figure out creative ways to leverage uh, a product to create uh, something that is beyond our imagination. So I'm pretty optimistic. Awesome. Ethan, I really wanted to thank you very much for this conversation, for uh, uh, unpacking what what makes a good 3D model, uh, your journey, and uh, like how also different ways in which your users are using Meshi. So thank you very, very much for being with us. I'm so happy to share what we have learned. And uh, thank you so much, Gabriele, for having me here. And uh, 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 let's maybe uh, like roll into another session if we have updates. And uh, I'm optimistic uh, about what's going on here. Uh, and I'm happy to, always happy to share what we learned to the community. Awesome, awesome. So community, you have heard, go out and try it out, uh, the different modalities, because there is a lot to learn, a lot to discover, a lot to take advantage of. So Ethan, thank you very much for being here and uh, see you next time then. 2026, maybe? <laughs> maybe <laughs> earlier. Hopefully sooner. Thank you, Gabriel. See you welcome. next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you really much for listening in. And remember to head to YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts and check out more insightful conversation revolving around XR and AI. And if you really like the show, please 
leave a review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or a thumbs up on YouTube. It really helps me keep doing this and shine the spotlight on the latest and greatest advancement in XR and AI. Till next time. Thank you.